Can I know? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to this part of the conference. I hope your workshops were, were fruitful and interesting. Um, a session that we, we've titled um, The Times They Are Changing. Um, uh, allow others to make out whether that was the appropriate title, and we did a little bit better this time. Um, really, the purpose of this session is for you to hear from three of our elected members. I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Councillor Jeff Burrows, who's the Cabinet Member for Social Care Safeguarding Health with Monmouthshire County Council, and Jeff will focus on adult services issues for us. He'll then be followed by Councillor Hugh David, who, as you know, is the WLJ spokesperson for health and social care, and the deputy leader of Bridgend County Council will focus on children's services issues, and, and who will then be followed by Councillor Barbara Smith, MBE, the lead member for modernisation and housing with Denbyshire County Council, who will focus on housing issues. The format we're going to use this afternoon is each of the members will come and present to you on their issue for 10 minutes, and when we've heard off all three of them, we'll then open up the conference for your, your observations, your comments and questions. So, no, with no further ado, I'll pass you over to Councillor Jeff Burrows. Right, well, good afternoon, everyone. And if I could just thank the WLGA for inviting me to say a few words to you today. As an Englishman who's lived in Wales for 35 years, it's not with a little envy I say best of luck for tomorrow night. <laughs> Evoking Oscar Wilde's famous quote, to come out of Europe once is unfortunate, to do it twice in a week is carelessness. <laughs> I'm County Councillor Jeff Burrows, and I have the privilege of being the Cabinet Member in Monmouthshire for Social Care, Safeguarding and Health, and have been so for the last five years. The strapline for this conference, people at the heart of what we do, is most apt as it resonates and underpins, in my view, the overarching philosophy that has driven us in Monmouthshire in recent years. I know, irrespective of our social care roles, whether it be political or professional, that the challenges we face boil down simply to the people dealing with people. The consequence of this is that the issues we all face together, we address by making the very best decisions possible, taking account of the idiosyncratic influences of the regions we represent. I should like to share with you today just some of the topics that we've been addressing in adult services to give you a flavour of our mindset when tackling the problems of the day. But before I do, I'll just give you a little bit of a background about Monmouthshire. Our beautiful rural county has about 90,000 residents and has a high percentage of older age groups compared to the Welsh average. And this is set to continue significantly in the years ahead. So it's vital that the solutions we adopt are future-proofed. We as an organisation embraced integrated working with health and the voluntary sector years ago. The upshot of this is that we have considerable experience now in decentralising to frontline staff the responsibility of decision making with respect to budgetary matters. And that includes not only our own council staff, but also those co-located with us from the other organisations I mentioned. We, do, we, had, had, we have had no problem with health staff spending our budget as the flip side of their spending decisions is the acknowledged individual responsibility that they take for their actions. As with many other authorities, we're about people. So let's just remind ourselves for a minute how our assessment of people have changed in recent years. Mrs Jones had presented to local social services that she was becoming increasingly frail, depressed and lonely. Previously, she would have been assessed accordingly and to address the need, she probably would have been transported once a week to a day centre. So isolated for six days and overdosed on social interaction for one. Today, we don't just hear her needs, we listen and try to make sense of what is important to her. And it transpires that all she wants is assistance to go to the local shop and catch up with friends she knows on the way. Through befriending, her outcomes are met, and certainly not the outcome of giving purpose to a day centre. My day, my life is our person-centred way of establishing on an individual basis for people with learning and physical disabilities to provide a variety of aspirational activities that they tell us are of value to them. Our community coordination project has been very worthwhile. Excuse me a second, once I can get this to work. Our community coordination project has been very worthwhile studying in finding alternative community solutions to people that were just on the brink of need and who have, with facilitation, found community solutions that otherwise would have commenced as care packages. Indeed, for a number of people in the community who start as potentially becoming dependent, have actually now become volunteers and are con contributing to the well-being of others. 
It goes back to the comments of Dr. Rebecca Payne yesterday in establishing what the true underlying causes of need actually are. And they sometimes require just a little patience in unearthing them. This brings me on to our Raglan project. Like everyone here today, we've always been dismayed by the outcomes or lack of them with task and time-based domiciliary care, especially with people suffering from dementia. I know the Raglan project has been acknowledged as an example of an alternative domiciliary care methodology, and I certainly agree that it's working for us. What I would say though, and this is very important, the essence of this concept was not top-down. It didn't come from enlightened officers, it was bottom-up. It came from the care staff themselves, saying that they were frustrated by the circumstances they were having to offer, and they came to us with bold ideas on how they thought it could improve. We gave them that opportunity, and the rest is history. My message to conference, therefore, is that Raglan is not a panacea. Listen to your staff, and work with them, and develop solutions that work for you. The project started a couple of years ago when the methodology completely changed. And with our part-time staff in the Raglan area, a decentralized hub was formed. They were elevated to full-time and were given complete control in the management of their budget and left to figure for themselves. So in conjunction with the service users, carers, families and friends, a more holistic approach to their interactions and daily work plan commenced. The results have been extraordinary. The perceived quality of service is acknowledged to be extremely high, as was witnessed by the previous Social Services Minister who visited us last year. The morale of the staff is transformed and it has been fiscally neutral, so we're delivering better for the same. The rate of delivery is not static. After intensive initial work and relationship building, the staff are able to gear down, allowing reablement and improved independence, reducing to a just checking position where applicable and on hand to revert if there's slippage. Very importantly, we're also re-abling people with dementia and enabling them to improve their well-being and independence too. It is an important point I picked up in the workshop yesterday regarding the emotional costs that staff give in the building of relationships, especially when end-of-life issues emerge. Indeed, the staff are now so valued by the service users and the immediate family to the extent that they are examples of them staying overnight, sleeping in, and staying with the person and family concerned until the end. Not only in, this, in my view is this a very conscientious contribution to a very significant moment in a family's life, but in simple resource terms, end-of-life issues in hospitals are very resource-intensive and expensive, and this dignified approach negates this. We have taken the next step and trained the remainder of our domestic care staff together with the background admin support and OT nurses, etc. 350 people in all, who collectively support 25% of those who need this service in the county. It was rolled out earlier this year and has truly become the Monmouthshire project. It is early days, but the feedback is the same. And very importantly, the budget is holding. There are savings that come to, into play, for example. Our accounting function does not have time to spend on chasing budget positions because everyone who has this responsibility is reporting back to the last penny, unheard of prior to this. This, though, is only 25% of the solution. And for me, we can only bring out the laurels to rest upon when the remaining 75% that is delivered by the private sector has embraced the principles of the Raglan project and are working with our commissioners to deliver this. I'm very pleased to announce today that we've been working with our private sector partners for over a year, working together to see how these holistic principles could embed into their own business plans. And I'm informed that we're now very close to this becoming a reality. Perhaps one day soon, time and task with domiciliary care will be consigned to history in Monmouthshire. I will finish on that point, but just to offer that we're open to talk to anyone who think they may be able to benefit from our experiences. There are no easy solutions, but the message that Dr. Lisa Leahy gave yesterday about technical, technical solutions and adaptive change, you will only deliver improvements of significance if your organizational culture is in a place that will allow it both politically and operationally. And trust me, that takes time to change. Thank you. Pranam Da, or is it Bora Da? Pranam Da, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Local government are committed to offering every child the best possible start in life, and within this, supporting and promoting their well-being. As a counsellor, I, like each and every councillor in the hall, 
has a special legal and moral responsibility for the care, education and future life chances of every child that is looked after by our local authorities as corporate parents. We have responsibilities for making sure that the Council is delivering its aims for local children and young people, planning improved safeguards and better outcomes, and working with statutory and voluntary partners to ensure sufficient funding, priority setting and commissioning of services. There are small but effective steps that we can and do take. For example, by providing work experience opportunities to our looked after children and young people. We are, however, well aware that more, far more needs to be done to be able to support children and young people in Wales and to promote their well-being. Over the last decade, the number of looked after children in Wales has been steadily rising and we know that outcomes for these children are simply unacceptable. A third, a third of boys and over 60% of girls in custody in Wales either are in our care, we are supposed to be their parents, or have been in our care. In recent times, we've seen increasing awareness of issues such as child sexual exploitation, with recent inquiries and scandals again highlighting the scale of the problem. Child sexual exploitation is a crime that takes place in every county, every city and every town in Wales. Again, many of the victims, far too many of the victims, are looked after children, the children who we are the corporate parents for. But progress has been made. Locally and across Wales, we're working closely together to develop and implement robust, coordinated activity at all stages of a child's journey from identification to protection to treatment. Our problems are not just here in Wales, though. They are international problems, too. It is estimated that half, half of the 4.6 million refugees from Syria are children. We are seeing a significant increase in the number of unaccompanied asylum-seeking children across the UK. Some of the most vulnerable children in the world that we in Wales have to be ready to support. These issues highlight the need to make sure that the well-being of the child is at the centre of decision-making. But there is also a need to make sure that we have knowledge and awareness of the needs and care of these vulnerable children and young people. Services are already stretched. In some places they are stretched to the limit. But there is a need for appropriate levels of support to help build capacity and infrastructure to support local delivery, to ensure staff are informed and equipped to undertake their roles effectively and meet the needs of the children cared for. So what are the opportunities that we have to be able to promote the well-being of children and young people? Both the Social Services and Wellbeing Act and the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act are big drivers. We've already seen regional children's safeguarding boards established and the launch of the National Adoption Service for Wales, with local government playing a vital leadership role in its development. This is a service designed to ensure that children and prospective adopter parents can be afforded the security and satisfaction of becoming a new family as quickly and safely as possible. With the Act, regional partnership boards have been established these will support an integrated approach to the development of services, care and support, which focuses on the opportunities for prevention and early intervention. In relation to services for children and young people, the aim is to provide support to families to prevent the need for children to become looked after or enter custody. New initiatives such as the introduction of the When I'm Ready scheme 
have been introduced under the Act, and whilst local authorities see the scheme as a very positive development, recognising the fact that not all young people are ready to move to independent living at 18, there remains serious concerns over the costs associated with its implementation, with no additional funding provided. Are you listening, Albert? <laughs> Thank you, Albert. Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> there has been and there continues to be a shortage of appropriate quality accommodation for our children and young people, and this is something that we are addressing. Working with Welsh Government through the Improving Outcomes for Children Strategic Steering Group, we are also looking to develop a national approach to look after children. The key aim of this work is to help promote collaborative work in across agencies and identify good practice, making improvements where they're needed. The approach seeks to identify ways to improve outcomes for looked after children and to de-escalate the patterns of interventions in the lives of children. Giving children and families every chance to stay together where this is safe to do so. There are also opportunities through the Together for Children and Young People programme aimed at improving the emotional and mental health services provided for children and young people in Wales. And I'd like to thank the Welsh Government for the investment in that service, uh, Albert. It is encouraging that local government are fully engaged with this programme. Timely access to CAM service is so important. The ability to identify early on where there may be additional need for support is critical. We also need to ensure that those children and young people with less serious conditions have clear alternative pathways to have their needs met in primary care or by other providers in a similar, timely and appropriate fashion. Emotional mental health and wellbeing services are provided by a wide range of statutory and third sector organisations, working in partnership particularly with schools to get the balance right between these will be key to the success of this programme. This year's budget from Welsh Government also increased the Intermediate Care Fund, which has been expanded to include children with complex needs. Thank you, Albert. This is a valuable opportunity to drive and enable integrated working between social services health and housing, and the third and independent sectors to support the well-being of children and young people. There are clear challenges and opportunities available to us to be able to promote the well-being of children and young people. But it is clear that this is not a goal that can be achieved by local authorities alone. With our key partners in health and the third sector, and working closely with private providers and our communities, we all have a responsibility to lead the transformation that is required for sustainable social services into the future. We need to build capability and capacity within our communities. We need to examine the plethora of funding streams that support children and young people, ensuring that these are aligned. Previous years have seen some of these funding streams receive significant cuts that have had, then had a major impact on services delivered on a local level. This is something that we cannot withstand in future years. Local government has done a tremendous job in improving efficiency, whilst maintaining and even improving the quality of social care over recent years. And it has been estimated that in the last four years, local government in Wales has made savings of nearly a billion, nearly a billion pounds that we've had to find uh, in our budgets. And that has been incredibly difficult for us to do. This, however, has very real limits. And the impact of the ongoing financial pressures means that if appropriate funding to support new initiatives is not available, it is the early intervention and preventative services that we will be relying on to enable us to promote the well-being of children and young people that will be at greatest risk. Thank you, Conference.
I'll bring Handar. Good afternoon. I'm going to talk about the impact of housing on well-being. And although this is a national conference, I cannot comment in detail on practices across Wales as I don't have that knowledge. So I'm going to illustrate my comments with examples from Denbyshire. Obviously, housing is important, but is it an essential basic need? Maslow's hierarchy of needs is about the well-being of an individual. He places shelter as one of our basic life needs and says if you cannot fulfil your biological and physiological needs, you cannot progress through the hierarchy of needs to personal growth and fulfilment. So what... What part does housing play in well-being? The Social Services and Wellbeing Act 2014 gives eight definitions of well-being, including the suitability of living accommodation. Good quality housing influences most of these definitions, demonstrating the need for a holistic approach to well-being. Housing is not just bricks and mortar. If they are poorly designed, badly maintained, unaffordable and with poor transport links, there can be a negative effect on individuals, families and communities. These impacts can include physical and mental health, fear of crime and personal safety, educational attainment, disposable income and opportunities for training and employment. Our well-being does not only depend on one facet of our lives and no one service can provide all we need for our whole well-being. So we need to adopt a corporate approach across the authority. For example, good extra care in Denbyshire isn't just about the building. It's about working with social services to ensure the design is physically suitable and will provide a safe and stimulating environment. Working with planning to make sure the designs will be approved and the quality is right. Working with the housing council, council housing function to use the housing revenue account to support wider housing objectives. And it's about working with the public realm to make sure that there is access to good outdoor space. Other examples of our corporate approach are social services working with housing and planning to build and adapt homes for specialist needs. Social services planning and the housing work together to bring empty homes back into use. And planning and procurement encouraging the use of local contractors to boost the local economy and provide employment and apprenticeships. Community benefits were included in all contracts, and this has led to two permanent jobs following the Arbed scheme in Denbyshire. Denbyshire is one of the authorities that has retained the council housing function, and this has enabled them to use the housing revenue account in creative and effective ways to support wider housing wellbeing objectives. Current achievements include achieving the Welsh housing quality standard, upgrading the play areas, creating allotment areas for residents, providing leisure passes for council tenants, creating area plans focusing on culture, well-being, education, crime and housing needs, redesigning areas to provide more attractive environments, neighbourhood officers to interact with residents and address concerns, now joined by community development officers to complement housing work and de develop cross-tenure community planning and increasing the occupation engagement of its residents. These are some current housing projects, allotments, refurbished areas, redesigned play areas and green spaces. Often the complexity of people's needs require an approach that covers not only different services within the local authority, but also different partner organisations. We need to encourage the active involvement and support of partner agencies. The Welsh Index of Multiple Deprivation reveals severe deprivation in areas of Denbyshire, including Real West and Upper Denby. With the use of the Welsh Government's Strategic Regeneration Fund and the use of the Social Housing Grant and the Housing Revenue Account, Denbyshire has supported projects in these areas. Working with the Welsh Government, registered social landlords and contractors, Denbyshire has developed, demolished a large area of substandard housing in Real West, created a green space and is rebuilding more suitable accommodation in the area. 
The creation of green space has enabled the community to exercise and socialise, which in its turn contributes to better mental health and well-being and fosters a sense of community. In Prince's Street Rill, low-quality houses and multiple occupation were purchased by Cluid Allen Registered Social Landlord and refurbished for family use. Introducing more family housing changes the balance within a community. In Upper Denby, I don't have a picture for this, the Arbed scheme, a fuel economy initiative on private and council houses, has been possible, working with the Welsh Government, planning, housing, CAB and local contractors, providing fuel efficient houses, apprenticeships, increased incomes and community benefit. So how are we mainstreaming well-being outcomes through existing plans and strategies? In Denbyshire's corporate plan, two of the seven key priorities for Denbyshire are linked to well-being. These are vulnerable people are protected and are able to live as independently as possible and ensuring access to good quality housing. A key feature of, so of Denbyshire's social care plan is the change in emphasis from dependence to enabling clients to live independently. This includes the development of extra care housing, the adaptation of homes to meet specific needs, and ensuring that vulnerable people at risk of becoming homeless have access to suitable and appropriate accommodation. Denbyshire's wellbeing plan focuses on independence and resilience, empowering residents to maintain their own independence and wellbeing. Housing plays an important role in providing housing and housing-related services which lend themselves to independence as opposed to dependence. Denbyshire's local development plan is a statutory long-term plan to guide the shape of the built environment, detailing land for housing and policies on the provision of affordable housing. And Denbyshire's housing strategy has five themes and all address different aspects of well-being. These are delivered through the housing action plan and the themes are delivering more homes to meet local need and demand, affordable housing, safety and healthy homes, supporting independence and preventing homelessness, and delivering sustainable communities. Support from all stakeholders in the early stages of planning a solution to any problem will demonstrate a shared commitment and understanding of the challenges. This is why collaboration is an important principle, not because it delivers economies of scale, but because it delivers well thought out, holistic services that address problems effectively. Specific assistance that could be useful from partner organisations includes the Welsh Government, who can help by ending the right to buy, provide incentives to local authorities to build additional new homes, bring back em bringing back empty homes into use, improving communities and supporting and engaging with their tenants. The private rented sector is playing, sorry, um, the housing associations have a crucial role to play in the housing system in delivering new and affordable homes bringing empty homes back into use. The private rented sector is playing an increasingly important role in the housing market. The Housing Act Wales 2014 enables local authorities to alleviate homelessness by using accommodation in the private sector. But there are still significant challenges in improving the condition of older homes in the private sector. Developers can help reduce the housing shortage by building more new houses, a proportion of which should be affordable they can also contribute to the local economy by using local firms and training local apprentices and providing green spaces. The provision of financial benefit and debt advice by third party organisations will enable families to have more control over finances. But more can be done to increase the housing supply, improve housing quality in the social and private sector, the licensing of private sector landlords is important to ensure standards and the worst properties are addressed. Engage with landlords to improve the offer in the private sector. In Denbyshire, 16% of all housing is privately rented and the affordability of the private sector is a big issue compared with income levels in the county. Also to prevent more to be done to prevent homelessness, reduce poverty, increase, increase disposable incomes, improve, improve energy efficiency, targeting at the disadvantage to help address fuel poverty, create opportunities for employment and training and apprenticeships, and provide suitable housing for looked after children. As corporate parents, we have a duty to support them during transition from child to adult services 
and provide a stable environment after leaving care. So, in conclusion, housing is at the centre of well-being. It plays a key role in reducing inequalities. It has an important function in creating prosperous and sustainable communities. It does not exist within the social, political or economic vacuum, but is an important part of society. It can have a very positive contribution to the well-being of individuals, families and the wider community. And it contributes to the aspirations of the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act and the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act Wales. Dilkan thank you for listening. <laughs> can I just, yeah. I just want to say that I have concentrated on Denbyshire, but all local authorities in Wales contribute to wellbeing through their housing policies. Good quality, appropriate, affordable housing is the foundation of all public sector wellbeing strategies. Going forward, we need to collaborate and share our good practices to optimise outcomes for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Is that working? Yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, it's a question for each of you. If you were First Minister, <laughs> your dreams come true. Uh, what would you do? What would the first thing that you would do and, uh, and sort of suggest to all of us working together that we need to do to try and reduce that gap between the advantaged and the most disadvantaged? Because it picks on, you know, adults, children, housing. We know that the gap is getting worse in some places. In 21st century Wales, uh, you know, what would you do first? We've got all the legislation in place, but is there something missing that we haven't grabbed yet? An easy yeah. one for you. Jeff, would you like to start? <laughs> I'm ready to start, yeah. Given that it's so important to have very close collaboration with health and social care in order to really deliver all those things we've been talking about, I'd actually have the ministers responsible for everything instead of not three. <laughs> okay, thank you. Barbara? I really don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't have any aspirations to be first minister. I've got to point that out. Um, I think going back to it, I just have said housing is at the centre of well-being and I think that it's becoming a more important priority and I think people have to look at it and embed it within the way we look at it. We can't think of, say, the social services as a, in a vacuum in a chimney, that we've got to look at a corporate approach all the time for everything. I, I think for me it's that um, it's delivering on early intervention and prevention we hear it all the time. We know it's the case from all the international evidence that it, 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 it's, it works, but we've got to stick with it, haven't we? So in terms of um, future funding, we're going to have a, 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 an emergency budget or a budget by the current Chancellor of the Exchequer, apparently. Now, that is not going to be good news for Wales. It's not going to be good news for local authorities. Um, but... If we're to survive and if we're to co continue to tackle those equalities, we need to, to stick by families first, we need to stick by flying staff because we, we know they work. Um, so I, I guess we need to make them work better, we need to do more of it. Um, and I suppose that, that's partly First Minister's res responsibility. It's our responsibility as well, actually, isn't it, as, as, as partners across Wales. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sue. Great question. Any questions from anyone else? Observations? Sorry, we have a... Uh, thank you very much. Um, I very much enjoyed uh, listening to what was being said. Um, uh, my, my question really is that all speakers talk about the importance of collaboration and partnership. I just wondered how confident you are that we've got the partnership and collaboration right to make real progress. And if your confidence isn't high, what more needs to be done to make this uh, happen in reality? Who are you prepared to start us off on this one? I'll start, start with that if you want. It's absolutely vital if you're having collaboration, but, but certainly you know, it's down to your own experiences of how you're finding the collaborators that are around you. Certainly as far as South East Wales is concerned, I think the relationship between the local authorities is very important, given the, the political mix to actually have a mutual understanding of exactly what is it vitally important to them. 
But just as importantly, it's actually having that same kind of dialogue with the health authority that you're working with. And I have to say, from a South East Wales perspective, that we're blessed to actually have a very, very good working relationship. And it's from that you can then start to actually make real progress. So I can't really make comments for other parts of the principality, but certainly as far as South East Wales is concerned, and obviously from my own perspective, being the chair of the Gwen Frailty and having five years of working with uh, partners and seeing what can be done. For me, I, I, I'm... I, I see integrated working and I see collaboration as the only way forward, but it really does depend on the partners that you're working with. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, I think that the shadow of local government reorganisation has been over us for a while, and I think because of that, maybe we aren't, haven't been collaborating as well as we could have done, um, simply because we didn't know quite, especially in North Wales, we didn't quite know where we were going with that. Um, now that that's disappeared, at least in some form, um, I think we do need to collaborate more and I'm sure that uh, there will be a greater emphasis on that. We've all got, um, we, we all have to follow austerity, we've all got to find money, we have to collaborate more. Certainly in North Wales I would hope for a greater collaboration with, with health than there is at the moment. Um, I think that's probably one of our priorities. Like um, in Monmouthshire, in Bridgend, we've got excellent uh, uh, relationships with, with the health board. We've got what, what are called locality hubs, where we've got co-located and um, jointly managed uh, staff. Uh, when I visit the uh, hubs, I, I don't know, and I don't care which organisation uh, the people there work for. Um, I just know that they're all working together as teams to support families, children, and uh, vulnerable people. It's been incredibly successful. Um, so I just think it's more, we need to broaden that out to more, more services. Um, uh, I, I wanted to thank Welsh Government for, for that investment in the Intermediate Care Fund. That's helped um, enable more of that. Uh, Albert, I hope you're listening. Oh, I upset you earlier, I think. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, it, it's there, isn't it? We have got the building blocks, the programme that you're leading on in terms of um, mental health support services to children and young people. That's a very good example of a national programme where we're all working uh, together. And it's not just health and, and local authorities, it's the third sector, the, the independent sector, you know, schools, etc. Et Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Any questions? Sue? Um, thank you very much. In your talk, uh, Councillor David, you, you were um, referring to the difficult times that local government face local government and the amount of money that's been taken out of the budget. And we know that we're all involved in, in putting forward proposals for savings or, if you prefer, cuts. How do you, in that climate, actually um, protect or promote social care uh, when social care, you have to consider social care in the bigger round and also along with those services that we know are all equally important, those services around visible services. Yeah. So how do you, social care is often a hidden service and you don't always know you need social care until you need it. So how do you manage that in, in, in terms of keeping that um, at the forefront of what we need to do? Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, with great difficulty, I think. Um, but... I think it's where cabinet members and leaders have got to step up to, to the plate and ministers um, and, and I'm happy to do it with my constituents when they're complaining about the length of the grass or that there's no litter pickers or you know, the potholes haven't been filled and I will say to them, look, if I've got a choice between that or closing a day centre or taking home care away from a vulnerable elderly person, I'm sorry, I'll stand by that decision and that's what the, the, the cats mean. Um, so I, I think it's for uh, political leaders across Wales at every level to show that, that, that leadership. That's not to say that, um, because there are, there are cuts and savings and there's efficiency measures and there's always scope for efficiency measures. My fear is that the, the, there's less and less scope for efficiency sa savings and it, and it seems to be more and more about cats and I suppose that is the uh, the difficulty though if we can get that early intervention and prevention that I was talking about earlier right then 
that's another way of, of, of addressing some of the problems but at the same time as having cuts we have got communities that are expecting more and more they want better services they want more services and you can talk to people about austerity till you're blue in the face um and they still say yes but what about you know my service what, what are you going to do for me so it, it's difficult the public understand austerity but they don't want it to impact upon upon them so we also have a question at the front. Have we got a mic? Yeah. Thank you, and uh, well done to Jeff and Hugh and Barbara for giving their different aspects uh, on their presentation. Um, given uh, the public attitude um, at the moment, it would appear uh, to their and their dislike of politics, politicians, bureaucracy, public yeah. services, yeah. Yeah. everything is, is, seems to be coming under the, you know, under the criticism of, of our residents. Do you think uh, we could do more um, as councillors, as assembly members, MPs, Welsh government, whoever, to try and engage the public in why we are redesigning our services whether they be social services, housing services, any other service. Um, this is an essential task that we are trying to do. And in the future, hopefully, it will be for the benefit of our citizens. Um, what more could we do? What more should we have done? I, you know, I, I'm at a loss, really, to see what more we can do. But maybe you have other ideas. Thank you, thank you, Chair. I think for me, the most important point is really where we are as far as the perception of politicians are concerned. And I really do feel that if, through great effort, those who are politicians can actually start re-engaging with the public in terms of integ integrity and transparency about what exactly the messages they're trying to, to, to present to people, if we can actually start turning that one around and actually showing people for, for what they truly are, then maybe we can actually start getting difficult messages out that people can then believe because it's always a smoke screen uh, of, of perception of exactly what the message is because you get people on message for all sorts of things. I think it just needs a little bit more honesty and a bit more integrity and then maybe the messages that we portray will be taken more uh, in the round rather than the way they are at the moment. I've been involved in uh, politics now actively for 20 years. I know I don't look that uh, old, but um, <laughs> I have been. Um, and I have to say, last week, this week, has been the saddest part in my political career because with my colleagues, Phil and Hayley um, from Bridgend, and no doubt lots of colleagues, m perhaps on different sides of the argument on the EU referendum have been out knocking doors for the last, well, month, solidly, day and night, we've been out knocking doors. And I have never, ever experienced the um, open uh, hostility and attitude towards um, immigrant communities that I've experienced. And that's 20 years I've been out knocking doors. And I am, um, yeah, and, and it, and it, it doesn't just sadden me, it, it worries me that um, right, right, rights are wrong about whether we should be in Europe or out of Europe. Um, there were people in the campaign who have opened Pandora's box as far as I'm concerned because I, I have never heard that on the doorstep and it, we've legitimised that and there are signs already that that is having a very real impact on people's lives. You know, that people are, are the victims of discrimination uh, or more discrimination as a result of that. And we've got a, a big, a big, big challenge now as a, as a political leadership in, in Wales to try and, and across the UK to try and tackle that. Because the people I were talking to, many of the people I were talking to who, who wanted to leave, not all of them, not all of them, but many of them felt that the answers to all their problem problems were that these if these other people went and everything in the garden would be rosy well i don't think that's the case but it worries me that that has been given credibility and credence and we all need to stand together 
uh, to try and tackle th th those problems and those attitudes that have now risen to the, the surface right across the um, right across the UK. I've got to say that fills me with real alarm. I'm an English person and I've lived here for 43 years. And if we're going to start moving out immigrants, then maybe the Welsh will start moving out the English next. So I might have to look for another house somewhere. Um, but I think the difficulty about actual engagement with, the, with, with our residents is that um, we have to look at the bigger picture. Certainly in Cabinet, we don't always actually agree with our fellow councillors because we have to make difficult decisions. Um, that they have the luxury of turning around and, re and representing their residents about. Um, but, but there's a real problem with the way that we actually um, talk to people um, and, and how people react, because the truth is, is that people don't want to know about the bigger picture. They just want to know about the one thing. So in Denbyshire, we're doing a really good job with our highways, despite all the cuts, despite all the inefficiency we've had to do, our roads are actually better now than they were in 2012, but not everywhere. So every single resident that sees the road or the pothole outside their house thinks that we're doing a bad job. And when they write in the resident survey about how well we're doing, they say rubbish because we haven't done their pothole. So they're not looking at the bigger picture, they're just looking at how everything impacts on them. And I don't know the answer to that because we're not ever going to be able to resolve every single individual's personal problems. If anybody else has got any ideas, I'm welcome to listen to them. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, have we got one more question? On the inequalities gap, as a pre previous role as a health visitor, I really struggled with the fact I worked in a vulnerable area that wasn't part of flying staff, so you can't refer out to a vulnerable people who need it, while there's people accessing it who aren't vulnerable because we don't want to stigmatise it. Is there something we're going to do to address that? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I think that is a, that, that is a tension. Um, and ideally, every child would have a flying staff service, but obviously the, the money simply isn't, it, it isn't, there, isn't there for that. Um, I think there is some flexibility in the system and certainly um, whilst government are looking at, at more flexibility around uh, uh, flying staff, but, but, but I guess the risk is that if, if it becomes completely targeted, then do you lose that, um, that advantage of the universal provision at the moment where people, parents don't feel they're being stigmatised, do they? Because everyone in that... Yeah. In which, in which case, then we, we need to look at that 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 uh, that as a model. Um, you do have some parents who um, complain at the moment that, that they don't get access to, to the service, but um, that's something that we you know uh, that we will be looking at with Welsh government. They they've said that they want more flexibility, so we will uh, look at that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. I'll just draw this session to a conclusion. Uh, once again, could I ask you to show your appreciation for our three elected members, please?